Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue. Welcome to the Effortless English Show. I am the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program and VIP members only get a discount on my pronunciation course at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Today we continue our Effortless English Book Club lesson, lessons on Animal Farm. The book is Animal Farm. The author, George Orwell. Today, chapter four. Chapter four. We are on chapter four. There are ten chapters, I believe, total. Someone asked me today. Ten total chapters, so today, chapter number four. As usual, I will go through the book first, give you a summary of the basic story. What happens? What do the characters do? So just the basic ideas. The basic summary, the plot, we call this, the action. And then I'll go back, and then I'll discuss some of the deeper ideas. Again, with the ideas, you know, some are quite obvious. I think most people will see and agree on some of the obvious ideas. But there are also some deeper ideas, which are more my opinion or your opinion, and that's fine. We, we all want to find deeper meaning in these books, in these stories. I mean, that's the, one of the great, great things about these books is that they do have different levels of meaning and we can all find different meaning. So as, as always, like I always say, with the deeper meaning I'll give you my opinion just so you think about things. I want you to think about things. Do you have to agree with me 100%? No, of course not. I want you to think and ask questions and find your own meaning. Alright, let's first just go to the book and go through it. What happens in chapter 4? Here we go. All right, so chapter four, here we are. So it's late summer. Remember, the animals, they had their rebellion. They had their revolt. They were successful. They won. Yay! They kicked the humans off of the farm. In the last chapter, they all started to run the farm, and they were doing a very good job. Everybody was working very hard, with a couple exceptions. <laughs> we also saw in the last chapter the the beginnings of some some possible problems, right? Napoleon, the pig, he took the small puppies from the dogs and he and secretly started to educate them. And right now, so far, chapter four, we don't know what he's doing, but we'll see in chapter later chapters, it's not good. Also, Napoleon and all the and the other pigs started taking all the milk and the apples for themselves. So the pigs in the last chapter really became kind of at the top, the, the top leaders. They became the elite and started to take special things for, just for themselves. All right, now chapter four is actually a much more simple chapter. It's pretty it's pretty basic chapter. It's a little bit shorter. Uh, I, I think there's less deep meaning in this chapter. Uh, it's really uh, just kind of continues the plot. And there are some connections to, you know, the history of the Soviet Union and a few things, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's just talk about what happened. Okay, so what happened in Chapter 4? Um, well, first, Snowball and Napoleon, remember, the two leaders, the two pigs of the leaders, Snowball and Napoleon. Snowball is more of the intellectual. Napoleon is more of the, the really uh, kind of tricky guy who's very tough. All right. They start to have the idea of, of spreading their revolution. They want to tell all animals everywhere in the world, or at least in England, all about the revolution. So they want their revolution to happen in, on other farms also. They have the idea of basically a worldwide revolution. Right? So they send pigeons, the birds, pigeons, they send pigeons out to other farms in the area and they the pigeons teach the animals on those farms how to sing the song, Beasts of England, right? The revolutionary song. So, they're trying to spread their revolution to other farms now. 
Then we hear about Mr. Jones. Remember, he's, he's the guy that was the boss before, right? He's the, the top human that they kicked out. And he's been just sitting at a bar in the town, complaining about to everybody about, oh, he's suffering, it's not fair, the animals kicked him off his land. Uh, and the other farmers, uh, Orwell says, the other farmers sympathize in general, like, oh, they feel bad for Mr. Jones. But they don't really help him. And why don't they help him? Because they're also competing with him. So in some ways, the other farmers are a little bit happy that he's suffering because it's less competition for them. And then it talks about the neighbors. There's two farms next to Animal Farm. But again, these neighbors also don't like each other. So one neighbor, um, one is named Foxwood, and he's kind of like a really nice guy, very relaxed. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the name of the farm, Foxwood. And the, main, the farmer's name is Mr. Pilkington. He's an easygoing gentleman farmer who spends most of his time fishing and hunting. So, you have Animal Farm. On one side, you have uh, another farm, and the farmer's name is Mr. Pilkington. He's this really easygoing, means very relaxed, kind of soft gentleman, right? So he's just this kind of friendly, nice guy, easygoing. Um, and the, the, far, the other farm, the other neighbor farm, is run by Mr. Frederick, and he's the opposite. He's really a tough guy. Um, and he's always involved in lawsuits, so he's always taking people to court, he's always trying to get more and more money. And these two guys, they don't like each other, right? So Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick, the two neighbor farmers, they're, they don't like each other. So why is that important? Well, it's important because that means they won't work together, right? Because if they would work together, maybe they could help Mr. Jones defeat the animals and get his farm back. But they don't like each other, so they won't cooperate. They won't help each other, and they won't help Mr. Jones. However, both the neighbors are frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm, and they want to prevent their own animals from learning about it. So first, the, uh, the other farmers kind of laugh about the idea. Oh, those animals, haha, ha, there's no way. They can't, they can't take care of their own farm. And they say, oh, it's going to be a huge disaster. But of course, we saw in the beginning, it wasn't a huge disaster. That in the beginning, the animals actually are all working together, and they're all working hard, and things are going very well. So the other farmers expect a disaster. They expect the animals to fail. And we'll see later that, in fact, this does happen, but it doesn't happen immediately, right? There's a delay. In the beginning, all the animals are super happy. They're happy about their rebellion. They're all feeling really good, and they're all helping each other and working together. So things are fairly successful. Okay. And because things are successful in the beginning, there are rumors, right? Rumors are kind of like gossip. There are rumors about uh, the success of Animal Farm. So other animals on different farms start to hear, oh, the animals on Animal Farm, they, they kicked off the humans. The animals on Animal Farm, they're doing well. They're, they're managing their own farm, and they're successful, and they're happy. So all these, the good news about the rebellion starts to spread. And because of this, other animals on different farms start to misbehave. They start to do bad things. They don't follow the human's orders as much. And they all start singing that song, Beasts of England, kind of the propaganda song. They start to sing it on other farms. And the humans get really angry when they hear that song, and they try to punish any animal, any animal that sings that song, they, they beat them. He says they flog them on the spot. It means they beat them immediately. To flog is to beat, <clears throat> and kind of like as punishment. But even though they beat the animals who sing the song on different farms, not Animal Farm, the humans beat the animals for singing the song, but the song is irrepressible. To repress means to put down, push down. To make it go away. But irrepressible means cannot be repressed, cannot be put down. 
So in many ways, the more they punish the animals about singing that song, the more the song becomes, you know, dangerous and exciting and interesting to the other animals. So their attempt to, at censorship actually makes it worse, which is a common thing we will see uh, in the world. <laughs> Even today we see this. All right, continuing. Next we have, and this is really the final part of chapter four. Like I said, it's quite a simple chapter, actually. Uh, there's a big battle. There's a big fight. So a group, a flight of pigeons. A flight of pigeons means a group of pigeons come flying into Animal Farm, excited, ah! And they tell the animals that Jones, the farmer, and his men um, have entered the gate of the farm and they're coming to attack. They're coming to attack. They're going to try to take the farm back. They're going to attack the animals and take it back. They're going to try to recapture, capture again, the farm. But the animals aren't worried. They expected this. They had made a plan. Snowball, remember, he's very smart. And uh, he had expected the attack. And it says, Snowball studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaign. Maybe the Gallic Wars, I would guess. So Snowball the pig read the Julius Caesar book, so about how to how to do battles, how to fight. So he already had a plan. When the humans attacked, he had a plan to fight against them. So first Snowball launches, launch, to launch means to begin here, to launch, to start. He launches, he starts his first attack. So all the birds, the pigeons and the geese attack the humans. So Jones is coming, Jones has a gun, and the other guys have like sticks. First so the, the pigeons fly at their head and kind of attack their heads, and the geese come and bite at their feet. Now this is just a, it, he describes this, this is a light skirmishing maneuver. So skirmishing is kind of a military word. A skirmish is a small fight. It's a small fight, not the big main fight. So when two, let's say two armies are coming to fight, sometimes in front of the armies, if these are the main armies, sometimes there'll be a few guys at the front, maybe throwing rocks or shooting arrows or something, and the other group will also have a few guys at the front. Those are called skirmishers. And those two little groups, the small groups, will sometimes fight each other in the very beginning of the battle. And that's called a skirmish. It's a light fight, meaning light, meaning not heavy, not big, not strong. It's just kind of a small fight before the really big groups fight each other, the main battle. So the purpose is just to create confusion, a little confusion, right? That's what um, Snowball's trying to do with the birds. He sends all the birds to attack just to get the humans kind of uh, confused a little bit and so that they're not so organized. So finally, the men, you know, hit hit the geese and the hit the birds with sticks, and they all have and they fly away. And the men continue attacking. Next, the uh, Benjamin the donkey and all the sheep and also Snowball himself, they all rush forward. They go forward and they attack the men and they they hit them with their heads. Right? It says, but to head they headbutt them. A headbutt is when you strike when you hit someone with your head. So if two humans are fighting and you go <clears throat> like that, that's called a headbutt. A headbutt. Bam. So of course the animals, the sheep have horns, right? They got the big horns and they hit the man, they headbutt them. They hit them with their heads. And I guess the pig does it too. They all attack them with their heads. So they fight, fight, fight some more. But the men are too strong. The men have these big sticks still. And uh Snowball squeals. A squeal is this kind of sound. It's like a high cry or a high sound like pigs make. That's a squeal. So Snowball squeals, which is a signal for them to retreat. To retreat means to go backwards. So all the animals turn around and they run away. They go through the gate into the main part of the farm. 
And the humans, when they see this, the, far the attacking humans, the attacking farmers, they think, ah, we're, we've won, we're winning, and they run forward to chase them. But it's a trick. In fact, this is kind of a common old trick. The, the uh, Carthaginians use this against the Romans, and the Romans use this, the Mongols, it's a common military trick. Pretend you're running away, and then get them to chase you, and then you come in behind them and surround them. And that's what the animals are going to do. So, when the humans all get inside, then the big horses, the strong horses, and the big cows, and all the pigs, they all rush out and come in behind them, and so the humans are surrounded, and all the animals start attacking them at the same time. And Snowball raises his gun and shoots at, I mean, not Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, Snowball runs in a, to attack Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones raises his gun, the farmer, and shoots at him, but he misses. He hits him just a little on the side, but then most of it hits a sheep that's behind Snowball. So Snowball's injured a little bit, but the sheep is killed by the gun. Snowball continues and attacks. He throws himself. He hits Mr. Jones' legs, knocks Mr. Jones' back. The gun goes flying away. But then it says the most terrifying fighter was Boxer. Again, Boxer is the big hero of Animal Farm. So he's the toughest worker, and then now in the battle, he's the best fighter. So he comes in, and he, with his, he gets up, and he hits people with his hooves, right? So horses have hooves, those big, hard feet. And he's hitting the humans with them and knocking them around. And he's super strong. He's big, and he's strong. And the humans, the farmers, they panic. Ah, panic, right? It means like uh, overwhelming fear, total fear. So they ah, and they all turn around and they run away. <coughs> and the animals chase them, chase them, chase them, biting them and kicking them as the humans run away out to the road again. Oh, and I almost forgot that uh, Boxer during the battle hits one human in the head and uh, and seems to kill him. He he goes flat. So it seems like Boxer actually kills a human being during the fight. And all the rest of the humans run away. So, the battle's over. The animals win again. And they come in and uh, they see Boxer. They come back and they see Boxer. He's looking at the dead human. And Boxer actually is quite sad. And he says, oh, he's dead. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot I was wearing iron shoes. He had iron shoes. So Boxer wanted to hit the guy and hurt him, but he didn't want to kill him. So Boxer's not a killer. He's, he's actually a very good horse, right? He has a good heart, remember? He wants to help people. And even in the fight against the humans, Boxer doesn't have this desire to kill. He doesn't have this desire to control. He really genuinely wants to help others and even in a fight, he'll fight, he's very strong and brave, but he doesn't want to kill anyone. But, unfortunately, Snowball criticizes him, because the pigs are quite different. And uh, Snowball says, war is war. The only good human is a dead one. And again, we see how... We say in English, we say bloodthirsty, thirsty for blood, enjoying blood, enjoying killing. The pigs are bloodthirsty, right? The, the, the leaders of this revolution, the pigs, they're bloodthirsty. They're, they're, I mean, they're evil, basically. As, and we will see, this evil gets worse and worse. They pretend like they care and all, and they say lots of good things, but we can see their true character. Again, and we've already saw it last chapter. This chapter, we see something even that is actually a bit more evil. Snowball saying this, all humans must be killed. It's not just that humans are bad. It's not just that Mr. Jones was bad. It's that every single human being must die. Only good humans are dead. So this is mass murder he's talking about, really. It seems like he says one sentence, it doesn't seem much, but we're going to see this, this is, becomes a, a, a central thing. This murderous, this bloodthirstiness, this desire. 
uh, and the ability to use murder for power is something we're going to see get worse and worse and worse. And again, in these first chapters, things seem great, but we're, Orwell's already showing us the seeds of evil. Uh, next, a kind of small thing, Molly, remember the female horse that likes to look pretty? They... They, they, they look around, they can't find her. And they first they think, oh, maybe she got killed. Maybe she got hurt. But then they fi find her hiding. And they find out that she got scared. As soon as the battle started, she ran away and, and hid. Because she doesn't want to fight. All right, and then finally, they have a big celebration. They sing the song again, Beasts of England, yay, yay, yay. Um, Snowball gives a speech to saying that every animal must be willing to die for Animal Farm, if necessary. So again, we're seeing this, this, this theme of death and killing starts popping up now. Number one, all humans are evil and should be killed. Number two, all animals must be willing to die for the farm, to die for the revolution. Again, if you think about it, it's a scary thought. Finally, the animals create a new, uh, a couple uh, um, awards, basically, awards. It's called a military decoration. It means a military award. It's like a medal, like a medal. And one is called Animal Hero First Class. And they give this to Boxer and Snowball. Because they were like the really big heroes. And then they make another one called Animal Hero Second Class, which they give to the dead sheep. The sheep died for them in the fight. And finally, they, they, they decide to give a name to the battle. They call it the Battle of Cow Shed because it was, they, they had the fight near where the cows live, the cow house, the cow shed. And they find Mr. Jones' gun. And they're like, what should we do with the gun? Hmm. And they decide they, uh, they put it next to the flag. And two times a year, they shoot the gun to celebrate their revolution. They shoot it in October to celebrate the battle they just had this battle they just had the victory and they shoot it in this during the summer to celebrate the anniversary of the rebellion of the revolution all right that's it so basically not much happens in this chapter just the battle ja the, the battle is really the main thing that happens uh let's go back and talk about some meaning in this and then i'll do questions on face questions and comments on facebook so first let's talk about what are some of the meanings? What are some of the ideas that Orwell's communicating here? All right. First of all, the first one is really kind of historical. Because remember that uh, one meaning, one of the common things, uh, uh, patterns of Animal Farm, is that it is describing and criticizing the communist revolution in Russia, the Soviet Union. So that's, that's the surface, I would say, the surface uh, meaning. And so one obvious thing is that he's describing is, is he's really just kind of uh, describing in, with the animals what happened in the Soviet Union. So what happened? Well, first of all, they had their successful revolution. But then what happens? Well, then they tried to make, they had the idea, Lenin and Stalin, of a global communist revolution, right? The, the worldwide workers' revolution. So they decided, they had the idea to export, right? To send out the revolution. So in the Soviet Union, they did this by by supporting revolutions in other countries, in Cuba, for example, in, um, I don't know, Vietnam, um, and other places around the world. So they would try to support communist governments or communist revolutions in other countries. And so we, they developed this sort of global communist revolution, this idea. And so this is what the animals are doing, right? This is kind of the same idea. They're trying to send the revolution to other farms. It's the same basic idea. Ah, we're going to send our messengers to other farms and tell them about our revolution and tell them how great it is and tell them how evil the farmers are and support them or encourage them to have their own worldwide 
revolution, their own animal revolution. So in this way, he's kind of, I don't know if you could even, not even really criticizing, he's just more just describing what happened with communism, uh, especially the Soviet Union. After this communist, the Soviet revolution, they started to try to do it in other countries. So this idea of globalism, right, this worldwide revolution leading to a worldwide government. That's uh, one part of what he's describing. Um, the second thing we could maybe look at is that, you know, in the Soviet Union, then they had World War II, right? Soviet, just basic Soviet history. Germany invaded Russia, invaded the Soviet Union. So there was an attempt by an outside power, Germany, to invade the Soviet Union, and it failed, right? The Soviets won, the Germans were defeated, were pushed out, pushed back, and defeated. And so just as in that history, the same thing happens here. An external group, in this case the, the uh, Farmer Jones and his men, they try to invade Animal Farm, take it back, and they lose and the animals are victorious, just as the Soviet Union was in their war. So, that's a very basic level of meaning. Now another thing, another uh, key idea here, and this is true for, I think this is uh, something he's describing, and it's, it's, it's a common propaganda technique, a common population control technique, uh, mind control technique, and that is the creation of ex an external threat, an external enemy. An outside enemy. External means outside. So an outside enemy. And why? Why do, why do, you know, propagandists or leaders or people who are trying to control others, why do they do that? Why do they create or encourage? Sometimes they don't even create it. Sometimes it's there. It is actually real. But why do they encourage it? Why do they actually want external threats? Because it helps them have better, stronger, internal control. See, if, if everybody inside, for example, everyone, if the animal's inside Animal Farm, if they are afraid of an attack from the outside, if they're afraid the humans will attack them, if they're afraid an outside force will attack them, well, then they're easier to control because they're, they're more likely to follow the pigs. They're more likely to obey because they're afraid and they believe that the pigs will protect them from the humans. And so we see this you know, all around the world, all through history, we can see this technique, but especially in the 20th century and now, we can see this as a common thing again and again and again, that when a government or a group starts losing some power, they often will go to war. They often will attack. This happens in the United States. Several American presidents have done this. When their popularity is dropping, when they, maybe they're losing some control, what do they do? A war! A, an outside threat! Fight against some outside group and suddenly everybody inside the country is united against the bad guys on the outside. Right? And of course, it's, it's not just the United States. Many, 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 many groups and countries have used this technique. Why? Because it works. It usually works. It's usually a very strong and successful technique. This is why you see it used through history by many different countries in many different systems, and it's still used. Okay, this creation of an external enemy is a great way to unite and control a group of people. So it's a very common technique, so you should be careful of this technique uh, in any situation. The second part of this technique is the, and, and this is the second part is what makes this technique, I think, evil, is that usually the, the outside group is described as totally evil, right? That they're not just outsiders, they're not just a rival, they're not just competitors, they're evil and they deserve to die, right? So Snowball says all humans are evil, and deserve to die. 
And of course, that itself is evil. <laughs> it's a very evil sentiment, right? And so again, you've Nazi Germany, you know, Hitler, all Jews, Jews were made the group, the outside, the external group. Even though they were even inside Germany, they were they were instead of, they were removed from being citizens and made the outside evil enemy. And they were all evil. Not some Jews, not these Jews, not that those Jews. No, every single Jew was seen as evil, and they all deserve to die. Right? Or communists, you know, it's the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, the business people, the middle class. They all deserve to die. We saw what happened in Cambodia when they had this idea that all intellectuals, that all the, the middle and upper classes deserve to die. Mass, mass, mass murder. Evil. Evil far beyond anything we'd seen before in history. So horrible. So this is, this is what makes this, this very dangerous. So it's a natural propaganda technique because it works so well, an external enemy, to unite people inside. But the very big danger of it is that it can very easily become evil when the external enemy is said to not only be wrong, but to be evil. And that they don't even deserve to live, or they don't deserve to speak. They don't deserve free speech. They don't deserve freedom. Or even worse, they deserve to die. They don't deserve life. This is where it becomes evil. We see it with Google now, actually. I would say Google. The company Google is doing this. Uh, the social media companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, are all doing this. Not killing people yet. <laughs> but uh, they are saying that certain groups do not deserve to speak. Certain groups do not deserve to be heard, right? They're trying to create these external enemies that they don't like, that the employees and the management of Google have decided they don't like. And if you have a different political view or social view, then you don't deserve to speak, and they will ban you and block you and silence you. It's the same techniques they're using. Um, another meaning or another thing to think about with this chapter... Um, I would say is the reality of interconnection. This is a little more philosophical. But um, that basically, nothing happens in a vacuum. We say in English, nothing happens in a vacuum. What does that mean? It means nothing happens alone. Nothing is isolated. Nothing is truly separate. So, for example, in this story, Animal Farm, they have their rebellion, but it's Animal Farm is not the whole universe. It's not the whole world, right? They have neighbors. They have farms on either side. There are farms all there. This farm, this imaginary farm, is in England. And there are farms all over England and indeed all over the world. So their rebellion, their ideas are happening not just on the farm, but they, they also are interacting with the rest of the world, right? There's, so there's no separateness. They have neighbors. They have rivals, right? So they have rivals. What's that? Well, the other farmers. Any other p farmer in the world, potentially, possibly, is their rival. Because these animals are saying all humans are evil. Well, guess what happens when the humans hear this? The humans automatically decide, ah, Animal Farm is our enemy. So they're making enemies, and they're making possibly lots of enemies. Uh, also, because their revolution is not isolated, it means there are other farms that compete with them. There are other systems that compete. And we can see this in the world. There are competing ideas. And it's the, in general, it's the, the issue and the problem of the real world versus the fantasy. And you will see this with lots of revolutions, lots of political ideas of any kind, certainly of the communist, socialist kind, but, but even there's people who talk about, you know, uh, you know I used to be describe myself as libertarian, I still believe in maximum freedom, but some libertarians believe in this sort of fantasy theory, right? There's the sort of fantasy theory of these systems, economic systems, political systems. The problem with these things is that the, in the real world, they have to compete with other systems. Right? So, communist rev revolution happens, let's say, in the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union is not the whole world. It's not alone. So, they have competition. They had the United States, for example. They had Western Europe, for example. They had other countries that were competing against them. 
And because they had this idea of world revolution, well, the Cold War began. And, you know, maybe you could blame the United States also for that, probably. But I'm not really, I don't care about who you blame, but the reality is that they, there was a competition, right? This, this did not happen alone. Nothing's isolated. Nothing's alone. So, whatever we do affects other people and, or other societies, and they will react to what we do. I think that is one of the messages and one of the ideas we can see in chapter 4. So, the pigs decide we're going to send out and try to cause this revolution all over, everywhere. What does this do? It makes all the other farmers everywhere else suddenly, the human farmers, suddenly very nervous. Suddenly the other farmers start watching them and don't trust them and become their enemies. Now in chapter 4, nothing else happens yet. Only Mr. Jones attacks. The other farmers don't help him. But Mr. Jones does attack. He loses, but you can see that they're, st they're creating enemies, right? They've created enemies in chapter 4. They now have some external enemies. And they know it. So all the, and especially because Mr. Jones attacks. So on one hand, the good part about this external threat, this outside threat, the good part, meaning the powerful, effective part, is that it makes everybody in the farm more afraid. So they become more united, easier to control. That's the effective part of this strategy. However, <laughs> there's also a, uh, a negative side to it. It creates fear, right? It means all the animals become more fearful now because now they realize we have enemies. Mr. Jones is still out there. They didn't kill Mr. Jones. He could come back any time. Other farmers might decide to attack. Right? They, they've created enemies, so on one hand it's easier for the pigs to control them, but on the other hand, it makes everybody afraid. And again, this does make them easier to control, but that fear also means it's easier for a lot of evil things to happen. When people are afraid, they will do terrible things that normally they would not. When people are happy and calm, they usually don't do evil things. But when they're afraid, when they're afraid, when they think they need to defend themselves, when they're afraid of being attacked, they will do terrible things to protect themselves from their fears. And this is what we're going to see in future chapters, is that the pigs are going to use the animal's fear against them, this fear of these external enemies. And they're going to use these fears to do terrible, terrible, evil things, not only outside, but inside, against the other animals. They, they, they will start to create hell for the animals. It, they will eventually create something that is far, far worse than Mr. Jones. And this fear is part of it. And this fear causes the animals to start going along with, obeying these things. So it's kind of, it becomes kind of terrible. All right, well, that's really it. That's all I've got to say about chapter four. Um, like I said, it's a fairly simple chapter. I'll go to Facebook Live now. So down here I have my Facebook camera, and we've got some people commenting and watching on Facebook Live right now. I'm going to go. If you're on Facebook, now's the time. You can leave a question or a comment. Again, focus your comments on the book. General English questions I will not answer this time, maybe in the future. Okay, let's see what we got. Mm -hmm. So lots of people. Oh, I want to mention something about Google. By the way, please follow me on BitChute. BitChute. B I T. C H U T E bitshoot.com bitshoot bitshoot is a competitor of Google's a rival of Google and I am now adding all my videos to bitshoot also because Google YouTube is censoring a lot of people now and I, I already know because of Google's politics, they will not like this, these animal farm lessons because they're little 
kind of communists themselves. Corporate communists, I call them. <laughs> They're some kind of weird combination of a big corporation, but with kind of a communist, socialist type of uh, political views. It's, people call it cultural Marxism. It's the new name for it. It's this kind of weird version of communism or Marxism. It's, 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 it's not exactly traditional communism, but it's some kind of weird version of it. Anyway, that's what Google is. That's what most of the Google employees are and certain the, certainly the leadership and managers and owners are, the big shareholders. And so they're starting to block and ban and delete lots of channels and lots of videos about anything that they don't like. And I promise you, they will not like these videos because what what we are discussing with Animal Farm, what we are criticizing with Animal Farm, uh, are basically many of the things they believe and practice with their users. So, the truth is, at any time, Google might block my channel or suspend my channel or even delete my channel. So, if you want to continue getting my videos, you should follow me on BitChute also. It's my backup. I will continue to add to YouTube as long as I can, but it could happen. So please follow me on BitChute and join BitChute. You don't have to join it. There's nothing to do. Just go, go over there. BitChute.com. And I have the same username on BitChute. Just my name. AJ Hogue. A-J-H-O-G-E. I'll talk more about BitChute in future videos. Uh, and I really want to help them. Google, we need competition because YouTube is out of control. All right. Back to Facebook Live. Uh, scientists, so just a general comment. Um, I'm from Kurdistan. It's a really meaningful story, an outstanding book. It's full of metaphors. Thanks for your teaching to teach people. You are the best. Yes, that's right. It's full of metaphors. It can be called an allegory, an allegory or a parable. These are type of stories that, um, you know, they, they may seem simple or childish in the beginning. They might use animals as characters, but they're using it to describe and to something in the human world and usually to describe something much deeper. Another example, Aesop's Fables, right? You've heard of Aesop's Fables or some, even fairy tales and just old folk tales, old traditional stories. We'll have this, right? There's this, like this tale of the, the story. Tale means story here. The story of the rabbit and the turtle, right? Having the race. You've probably heard of this one, right? So it's not, of course, it's about a rabbit and a turtle, but there's a deeper meaning about persistence and working hard and not being lazy and all these kind of things. We can find much deeper meaning, but they use animals to tell the story and it makes the story kind of uh, easier and more enjoyable and easier to understand, but the meaning is deeper. Uh, some, a lot of, there's some religious stories are like this, where they use some kind of, uh, might be an animal, might be some kind of seemingly magical story, but uh, again, there's always a deeper meaning behind it. So these, exactly, these are called metaphors. The, the whole stories are called allegories or parables, where one thing represents something else. All right, back to Facebook, comments and questions. Seems like uh, fewer comments this time, which I understand. This is, uh, this is a simpler chapter. I think the chapters one, two, and three were a little more difficult, a little more complicated, complex. This one's quite simple, really. They just have a big fight. <laughs> I mean, there's not, I don't think it's, there's less deep meaning uh, in this one, I believe. Okay, Carol uh, also has a good point, uh, says, uh, this chapter also underlines how scary it is for people who are different, who don't think the same, because uh, uh, sometimes when people don't understand differences, they're scared about them, and this can lead to violence. Well, exactly right. I mean, this is why the technique works. I mean, in a very general way, we humans, 
probably animals too, um, are scared of the unknown. We're scared of what we don't know, right? Because, and if you think about it, for survival, this this is actually makes sense. It's it's understandable, because, um, you know, situations or even people who are unknown might be dangerous. And in fact, and if you think about the far human past, strangers. People that were not in your family, you didn't know them, somebody just walks into your town or walks up into your land and you don't know who they are. They might be someone who would kill you, they might attack you, they might want to steal from you. So strangers and unknown people were possibly dangerous and therefore not trusted. And with good reason, <laughs> okay? Many, many times outside groups would come in and attack other groups. I mean, all you have to do, look at history, it's, it's a big long story of one group attacking and invading another group again and again and again and again every single place everywhere in the world so there is there are some very good reasons that we don't trust outsiders or people who are different it's a it's a natural instinct and it's probably a good one the problem is that these uh, propagandists now can use advanced technology and you know in the 20th century they could use radio and film and now they've got television and the internet, movies, all these things um, to make our fear stronger and stronger and stronger and to attack the outside group more and more and more and to tell lots and lots and lots and lots of lies about the outside group and to make us really fearful and really, really, really hate them. Right? All war propaganda does this. Whenever a country wants to go to war, against another one. What do they do first? Well, they make their population hate them. They tell all these stories about how evil the other people are. It's happening in America right now. All the stupid stuff against Russia. Russia's evil. Russia's evil. There's a group in America that wants war with Russia and they're constantly the propaganda about how terrible Russia is. It's, yeah, it's all lies, 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 but they're trying to make people hate Russia because they want a, a war, or at least an economic war, against Russia. This technique is used again and again. It was, so, this is the dangerous part, and this is because it leads to killing. Okay, it leads to war and killing. That's why it's scary. So you have to be careful. Anytime you have this happening, especially now with modern technology, you should immediately question and not trust it. Because do some people do bad stuff? Yes. Um, even sometimes war is necessary, maybe. But you have to be very careful with this kind of propaganda. When every when 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 the other group's leader is terrible and and totally evil and a devil, don't trust it, be careful. When another group of people is terrible and evil, all of them, be careful. You're trying, they're trying to control you and make you hate. Yeah, that's another great question. How can you prevent the bad guys from controlling or entering a revolution so these guys don't murder it. Well, yeah, see, this is the problem. <laughs> we talked about it in some earlier uh, chapters. How indeed this is the problem of human nature? And I don't know, honestly. I think no one knows. Because um, the problem is that certain types of people are attracted to power and control. And, number two, with modern technology, they can gain much more control than in the past. So in the past, let's say a thousand years ago, very difficult to control everybody's life completely and control what they think and what they believed. There were no school systems, so people learned at home from their own families. So the king could not control everybody's belief 100%. He couldn't control education 100%. Couldn't, there were no televisions or radios. So, it was much more difficult to have the kind of total mind control. Now it's much easier. People are carrying phones with them all the time. 
right? Videos, it's just overwhelming. Television shows, they put it in everything. The propaganda is put into everything. You are being targeted with propaganda constantly, all the time. So it is very hard now. And bad people are attracted to that power. How do you prevent it? I think at, a, at an individual level and at a family level, you have to guard yourself against the propaganda. You have to learn these techniques. This is why I'm doing this chapter, because these techniques are common. So when you learn them, you'll start to see them. You'll realize they're being used. You, you, you won't automatically believe everything now. Like now, with I, I, my life, if the American media starts trying to say one, some country's evil, I know right away they're trying to create some kind of war. And I don't believe them because they lied, lied, lied in the past again and again and again. So now I don't believe them. And the good news is a lot, a lot of Americans now don't believe them. It's much more difficult now to convince normal American people with this propaganda. But does it still work sometimes? Yes, it still does. It still can work. But the more people can learn these techniques and you, you need individual group, individuals and families that are strong, that know these techniques, that can kind of protect themselves against these techniques. Um, I think that's how you do it. If, if, these guys, if, you, if these guys lose their trust, these bad people that are these control freaks, we call them, that want to control everybody, if they lose their um, ability to control people's thoughts and beliefs, they lose most of their power. Even if they're still really rich, they still lose a lot of their power. It's not really, it's not so much money is, the, is what gives them the power, it's the ability to control people's minds. And of course they do it by buying TV stations and newspapers and all and all, making movies and all these things. But that's the source of their power. So that's where we can, it, that's why I think this book is very important. Yeah, so another good comment here. My name is Ilya. Um, the same situation now. The censorship wants to silence people like you who discuss inconvenient topics for the government or for even for certain companies. Uh, we may not have this, the same number of murders yet, um, but it's important to avoid the danger of totalitarianism in our current world. But that's why we have to avoid the danger of propaganda and find the truth. Absolutely, I agree. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I decided. You know, I used to not do anything political, nothing political. And I changed my mind uh, this well, last year as I saw the censorship starting to go crazy with Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the American media, which is the American media now is probably less trusted than the Soviet Union's media, okay? It's the same, they just, it's just lies. They, they, only crazy people trust the American media now. It's just, it's just constant lies, 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 and very dangerous, but they want, and now they're starting the censorship because what happened is social media, Google, Facebook, social media, people were starting to tell the truth, or at least they were starting to show the lies, right? So maybe, let's say, CNN would lie about something, but then people online, individuals, just regular people like you and me, would start showing the proof that they were lying. And, oh, they don't like that, because suddenly the propaganda is not working as much. And so this is why now Google is silencing and deleting comments and deleting channels, and Facebook's doing it, Twitter's doing it, they're all doing it. Um, very dangerous because the, the danger, this is why I decided to st stop being quiet about it, is the danger is if they succeed, if they silence people, the next step is killing or, in, or at least prison. The next step, they're doing it in England right now. They're doing it in England now. They're starting to arrest people for saying unpopular things on Facebook. Putting people in jail for this. This is the danger. And the, the step after that is they actually start to kill people. 
this is the direction it goes. All, just, all we have to do is look at history. We see it happen again and again and again. And so the time to speak up and fight is now before they succeed. Because if the censorship succeeds, then the really terrible evil starts. And we will see it in Animal Farm, that exact message, because... Right now, in chapter 4, everything seems fine still, but we're going to see the censorship's going to start. And then after that, once they accept that, the really horrible stuff will start with Animal Farm. And we've seen it again in, in history with many different systems where these kind of total control, it's called totalitarianism, it means total control by a small group. And... You know, they take over education. We saw that with Napoleon getting the puppies. They take, they want to start controlling the young people and brainwashing them with propaganda. That's one of the first steps. And then censorship is usually comes soon after that. That is the stage we're in right now in the West, uh, Europe and the United States. And I feel, just as a human being, I have to say something. I have to do, try to do at least a little bit to, to fight against that because I know where it's going to go after this. So that's why I'm doing Animal Farm. That's why I'm doing this lesson. I, I just want to share these. I want people to see the techniques as they happen. And it's, governments do this, but the, the dangerous part now, we're starting to see these super rich, huge, super powerful corporations, companies, are also gaining control of our communication. And they are using these techniques too. And in fact... These companies work with governments often. Google gets lots of money for, from the United States government, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's scary. It is frightening. It's frightening what's happening now, and that's why this, this animal farm is more important than ever. It's a very important book for us. All right. Hello, teacher. Quite right. Uh, so we don't voice the propaganda Russia or Syria or the yeah, right. Well, exactly. In America, I can speak from America. I don't. Uh, I don't really want to criticize other countries because, uh, first of all, I'm not a citizen of uh, those other countries, and I'm not an expert on those other countries. But I can say in the United States, I'm a citizen, so I. I'm, and I, uh, I know the situation in America quite well. And yes, right now, lots of propaganda against Syria and Russia. Um, they want to, you know, they did this to us with Iraq, Afghanistan, I mean, I, Iran. Eh. They, they, they want us in wars. And eventually they want us to go to war with Iran, too. I mean, it's, it's obvious what they're, what they're trying to do. Uh, the good news is, because they lied, especially with Iraq, with the Iraq War, they lied so much that people actually, the lies came out, again, because of social media. This is why social media is important in the internet. The lies came out afterwards. It was too late, unfortunately. But we did learn about all the lies that they told to make people want that war. And now a lot of people realize those lies, and now they don't trust it. Some people still do. They're not so smart. But... Many, many more Americans now don't trust the media. They don't trust the propaganda. They see the techniques. And this is, you know, like the earlier question, how do we prevent these evil people controlling us? That's how. That's how. They still have a lot of power, yes. A lot of people still believe them, yes. But fewer people believe them. More people see the lies. Their power is now less. And that's good news for everybody. So that's how you do it in your own country, if you, the same issue. This is all over the world. Like I said, truth is what's important. Truth, 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 truth. The truth will set you free is the famous phrase, right? So just, uh, that's why I, it really is very powerful just to know the techniques. And the techniques are not always evil. I mean, you know, these kind of, some of these techniques are used for persuasion. They're used for business. They're used for sales. They're not always used for evil purposes, but it's still just good to know them and to recognize them. So then you can make a clear decision. You can make a clear decision. You, you will not be controlled. You're not, your, your emotions and your ideas will not be, you know, 
we, call, we say manipulated, kind of the idea of controlled from the outside. When you see through the techniques, you can just ah, push away the techniques and you can just find your own information, make your own decisions, try to find the truth yourself. And uh, that's a much better way. It's better for you, it's better for everybody. Okay, so it looks like we're about done. I think there's not much more to say about chapter four. All right, so that's it really. Um, summarize again chapter four, basically they have a big battle. They try to send their revolution to other farms. They make some of the other humans kind of upset and, and make them the external, the outside enemy. And then the big event is Mr. Jones comes back with some men. They have a big battle. The animals win the battle. Yay! And that's it. So next week we will move to Chapter 5. So Animal Farm Chapter 5. Read Chapter 5. I don't remember what happens. I, I'll read it uh, this week. So I, I remember the whole story, but I don't specifically remember chapter five. We'll see. I do know it's going to get worse and worse and worse for the poor animals, <laughs> as we will see. All right, so chapter five. Well, chapter five, we're almost at the middle of the book now. Okay, as I said before, number one, follow me on BitChute. B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. BitChute.com bitshoot.com. It's a new video site. A little bit new. It's my backup for Twitter. I mean, uh, for YouTube. YouTube might delete my channel. They might block it. There's a good chance they will. So please follow me on Bitshoot. Same name, AJ Hogue. So we have a backup. So you can continue to get my free videos. So Bitshoot. And of course, join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Dot com. See you next week.